Good evening. Welcome all. Thank you for joining us this evening for one book, one SFU featuring Hiromi Goto, author of Shadow Life, in conversation with Sarah Levitt and Erica Hiroko Isamura. I am Gwen Bird, and I'm Dean of Libraries at Simon Fraser University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event this evening. I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking this evening from the unceded traditional and current territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. It's a great privilege to live and work in such abundant lands. I'm particularly aware of this right now as we see spring unfolding around us while the earth, ocean, rivers, and forests begin to emerge from winter. As an educational institution, SFU has a particular responsibility to address the historic and ongoing leg legacies of colonization, and we work to make the university an instrument of reconciliation. This event, One Book, One SFU, began in 2015 as an all SFU reading experience that is committed to the idea that libraries have a role in fostering ideas promoting books and reading, and facilitating dialogue toward a more just society. Each year we select a book and make copies available to the, our entire university community in Burnaby, Surrey, and Vancouver. We conclude this university-wide common reading experience with a free public event featuring the author. In the past recent years, we have read and discussed Johnny Appleseed with Joshua Whitehead, Washington Black with Essia Dugan, Son of a Trickster with Eden Robinson, Tomboy Survival Guide with Ivan Coyote, among others. It's an amazing list of books. This year, we are excited to be discussing the graphic novel Shadow Life, written by Hiromi Goto and illustrated by Anne Zhu. Shadow Life was awarded the Asian Pacific American Literature Award for Adult Fiction and just a few weeks ago was announced as one of the finalists in the graphic novel category for the Los Angeles Times Book Prizes. The winner will be announced in April and we'll be watching. Tonight we'll begin with a reading by Hiromi from Shadow Life, uh, followed by some conver conversation between our three panelists and then a brief Q&A which you can contribute to. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes to share. Please note that this event is being recorded. We have closed captioning available today, which you can access by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you to AI Media for providing the captioning tonight. Please make sure you're familiar with our community guidelines for this event, which we are sharing in the chat now. If you'd like to ask questions of our speakers, please submit using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We'll try to get to as many of these as we can during the Q&A period following the conversation between our panelists. And I'd like to extend our thanks to our event partners for making this evening possible, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and SFU Public Square. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers before turning the conversation to them. Sarah Levitt is the author and creator of several graphic novels. Her first book, Tangles, a story about Alzheimer's, My Mother and Me, was the first comic to be nominated for a Writer's Trust Award and has become a widely studied work in the growing field of comics and medicine. Her second book, Agnes Murderous, won, among other awards and long lists, a Vine Award for Canadian Jewish Literature. In addition to her published work, Sarah has also been developing and teaching comics classes in the UBC School of Creative Writing since 2012. In 2021, she became the school's first assistant professor of graphic forms. Her areas of interest include autobiographical comics, formal experimentation in comics, and comics pedagogy. The second author joining us tonight is Erika Hiroko Isomura. Erica is a Yonsei Japanese and Chinese Canadian essayist, poet, multidisciplinary artist, and cultural producer. She is the recipient of Room Magazine's 2021 Emerging Writer Award and won her, 
won first prize for creative nonfiction in Briar Patch's 2019 Writing in the Margins contest. Erica's writing and poetry is published and forthcoming in Canadian literary magazines, including Room, Carte Blanche, and The Fiddlehead. She's currently working on a book of essays, a poetry collection, and a project bringing multi-generational racialized artists into conversation with one another. Finally, our featured author, Hiromi Goto, is an emigrant from Japan who gratefully resides in Lekwungen territory. Her first novel, Chorus of Mushrooms, won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize Best First Book, Canada and Caribbean Region, and was co-winner of the Canada-Japan Book Award. Her second book, The Kappa Child, received the James Tiptree Jr. Memorial Award for gender-bending speculative fiction. She's published three novels for children and youth, a book of poetry, a collection of, and a collection of short stories. Her other honors include the Sunburst Award and the Carl Brandon Parallax Award. On a slightly more personal note, I would highly recommend following her on Twitter for a little beauty every day and a regular dose of gratitude and appreciation of the natural world. Shadow Life, Hiromi's most recent book with artist Anne Zhu is her first graphic novel, and I'm now very pleased to invite Hiromi to share a reading from Shadow Life. Thank you, Gwen, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to the SFU community for this honor. Um, it's so lovely to be here with friends. Um, also like to extend heartfelt gratitude to Anne Zhu, who brilliantly illustrated the book. Um, the book would absolutely not be uh, in book form without her beautiful translation of the text to image um, and um, yeah hands up for graphic artists everywhere um, going to be reading from a section of the book early on in chapter two um, kumiko is a 76 year old uh, widow who's been um, on the lamb she ran away from her supported housing, housing um, her adult daughters uh, thoughtfully placed her in for her for her wellness, but she, she needed to get out and live life on her own terms. So she sets herself up in a bachelor apartment in the sort of gay area of town, um, the town ve uh, very much looking like Vancouver here. And um, I'm reading from chapter two. And um, the text I'm reading from is the actual text that Anne received, the script. Um, and that way you can hear what the script sounded like as, as text um, as, and, and the image is what Anne came up with based on the words that I sent her. So here we go. Chapter two, close up aerial view of Kumiko's face eyes closed, water lapping her hair and cheeks. Hair length reaches just around her jawline and nape of neck. Goggles are hanging, floating around her neck. White hair, face wrinkled and a little sun damaged. Looks relaxed, she opens eyes, sees from her vantage point the large expanse of glass in the high ceiling, the reflection of the public swimming pool, the blueness of water, the old woman's floating body. She can't see outside because it's night dark. View from outside the skylight looking in, pan further back, there's a silhouette of a rounded animal-like head the size of a small cat that's ambiguous, uncanny. It's looking down at the old woman. She's floated into the middle of the lane, her arms spread wide to her side, her legs in a slight V. She has a short and sturdy body, round tummy, floats well. She closes her eyes thinking. It was so difficult to trust water again after Samuel's accident. Four years before I understood, it wasn't water's fault. Flashback, image of the back end of a car sinking into the water, the front is already submerged. Cutaway, Kumiko still floating on water, eyes, opens her eyes, she glances at the clock on wall, almost 10 p.m., 
She swings legs down and bring torso upright to tread water slowly, thinking. It was just his time to leave this world. It's the living who struggle to accept death. Ducking beneath the lane markers, she slowly breaststrokes against the empty lanes to get to the little, little ladder at the side. Lifeguard, woman in mid-forties, is hosing down the deck, grins. You float like a cork. Kumiko ponders, pictures herself in tread water position, morphing into a cork, which morphs into a fat fur seal. Kumiko smiles, picks up swimming bag from the hook on wall, walks carefully across slippery floor towards women's changing room. Sedna has watched over me my entire life. Lifeguard looks bemused, shrugs, continues hosing deck. Water spray from shower streams down Kumiko's face. She is stripped completely naked. She has a slightly C-curved six-inch sur surgical scar, mostly vertical along her lower right abdomen, but the ends lean a little towards the center of her body. She lathers up scrubby towel and rubs hard. Pan out. Three other Asian women, different body shapes and sizes, showering in similar manner. They chat with each other, but Kumiko does not. They are speaking in Korean. Note, want to keep in Korean text only to in illustrate the impermeability, impermeability of language if you don't understand it. Three women chatting. Kumiko turns off water, shower, gathers things, nods her head to the other women, they nod back. They converse with each other over the spray. Kumiko goes to the lockers and benches. Towels dry, gets clothes out of locker, sits on the bench to pull on trousers, socks, sturdy, merrill type runners, dressed in sweater, scarf around neck. Leaves community pool holding plastic bag and purse. Inhales deeply the night air, cloud cover against dark sky. Some glinting stars, clouds reflect city lights. Across the parking lot, across four lanes of traffic, a soccer field is lit up brightly by rafts of light affixed high on tall poles. The lit field is completely framed by darkness. It's like a mythical vision. The lean running soccer players in bright uniforms look vital and magical. Thank you. so wonderful to hear you read, Hiromi, and not just read from the book, but actually let us into that kind of secret um, uh, chemistry between you and Anne, that you came up with what you wanted to see in the book, and then were able to hear both your vision and how, and see how that came into life. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so the three of us have been having this conversation for a while now uh, in different forms, email, Google Docs, uh, Zoom meetings, where we're talking about how all of us have used text and image, used comics to talk about things um, in a different way than we might just with prose. Um, and how using comics can move us into this whole other way of, of storytelling. Um, so, Hromi, I wondered if you could start just by telling us a bit more about Kumiko. Um, it's clear from hearing you read the script um, and from seeing the images, like it, it's it's been, it was always very important to you um, that Kumiko looked a certain way and that her, her queerness and her particular body um, were shown to the reader. Can you, can you talk about that? Um, what I really love about the graphic form is that um, the bodies and the, the places, they're, they're, made, they're made visible and real um, and we can perceive them, we can see them um, without explanation. And so I think there's something really, you know, amazing and powerful about seeing someone like Kumiko, an um, older, fat, bisexual, uh, Asian, North American woman um, 
naked, you know, it, it, and it's on the one hand, very mundane. She's just doing her sort of daily things, um, but her body being there, her living her own subjective life and it being observed um, and witnessed uh, is, is, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Um, and so it, it, was, uh, it was thrilling to be able to bring a character like Kumiko um, into the, the center of, of, of her marvelous adventure at, you know, sort of the, at, towards the end of her life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she's such a strong physical presence. And, and yeah, like you say, it's, it's, it's mundane. We all have bodies, we all take baths, but to see this chunky, like just, I often just wanted to squeeze her because her body is just so beautiful and, and pleasing. And it's revolutionary to see it page after page. Um, I wondered if I could just ask you like a bit of a follow up. Listening to you read the script, it made me wonder: Did you and Anne go back and forth a number of times about how she would look? Or we there was there's some specifics um, I went over uh, with Anne um, and our editor um, Mariah um, about how I wanted her to look, but also understandings of the culture of the body and the represented body. Um, because, you know, in terms of sort of the standards of art school or, you know, quote unquote Western art, and you think of that, that Leonardo da Vinci, you know, <laughs> like this is the measure of the, you know, man, and then like it's like certain inches or whatever, certain ratios. But in fact, that's not a universal body scale, and there's all kinds of, of bodies. Um, and, you know, like we've had, we had very sort of intimate discussions around Kumiko's body, for instance, um, you know, the older uh, Asian uh, women of Asian ancestries I know who are of my mother's generation um, have particular kinds of body shapes, which is usually a longer torso um, and then shorter lengths, uh, shorter legs. And so that I, I really wanted that to be, um, you know, brought into so there's like so these kind of fine detailings about the culture of the body um that you know it was thrilling to be able to do that and to be um heard uh and to be understood and it for it to be um you know coming out on the page in the ways that i'd hoped for yeah wow i, I don't think that you could exaggerate how beautiful that is to be able to just say yeah this is what kamiko's body is going to look like she is chunky and she is old and these are her proportions yeah, yeah. beautiful and and the one of the other really striking things about this book is how um it talks about grief and loss and there's some ways in which um images are used very very powerfully to talk about some of the ways that kamiko is experiencing grief and loss in her life can you talk a bit about about that well, Kumiko is a widow, so she had, um, you know, uh, her husband who died many years previously, but it's, I think, for many people who've lost someone that, you know, grief and loss are, are, are things that you carry with you, um, and those feelings shift over time, um, and they evolve, um, and they wax and wane, and, you know, all this range of emotions, um, but not just strictly related to um, having the losses of, of, of someone who's who's died and passed, but also personal loss, personal losses that we might experience too with our, our own bodies, um, being able to do the things that you once do. Like um, I volunteer at a farm once a, a week. Um, at, 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 it's called Uminami and it's a beautiful, beautiful organic Japanese vegetable farm. Um, and we were pruning apple trees, like cutting the, the, the suckers off the branches. And, you know, when I was a child, I, I, I could climb any tree in, in any world, you know, but, you know, now I was up there clutching the main trunk saying, curse word, curse word. I don't know. Are we allowed to swear tonight? I'm not sure. I was saying curse word, curse word, and then clutching, you know, I was like, and knowing that if I fell now that I, I would break bones possibly. 
Mm -hmm. um, so like there's those kinds of physical losses and griefs too. So um, yeah. Yeah, and we see that in the book where, you know, Kamiko is dealing with things like telling, saying to herself like, okay, don't pee, don't pee. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, the body changes and then we in adapt and integrate, but we're almost like, <laughs> and it's yeah. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also, it can also be funny too, in its own way. It's absurd and funny. Totally. Yeah. I love that about comics, that there can be deep grief and a giggle at the same time. Like, you know, we can feel that Kimiko is mourning for the changes in her body, but we can also laugh a little bit about her fear of peeing while she's on the street. I don't know. Like, maybe some of us identify with that. I have no idea. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to turn to Erica now and, and say, um, Erica, you've been working on this beautiful series of diary comics um, that you've been doing during the pandemic um, and posting on Instagram. Um, and there's um, this wonderful connection with shadow life in terms of how you've been uh, looking at grief and loss and using diary comics to explore that. And I wondered if you could share some of that with us. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I started drawing this series of diary comics kind of on a daily basis when the pandemic first began. And that was actually also a time where I was working one on one with Hiromi through a mentorship. And uh, I remember, you know, we'd set certain writing goals for, for me and Hermie would check in like, how's your writing going um, as the pandemic was starting and, you know, we were all at home in lockdown and I was like, well, I haven't been able to do any writing, but I started drawing comics and I started to email them to her and um, I would email them to my friends each week. Um, so this is the first time they were being shared a bit more in the public realm. Um, and they do depict grief, but also, like you said, there's moments of care and joy that are embedded too, because it's about the everyday. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll share a few with, with folks listening in. Um, the first one depicts this big bright moon in the sky and it reads, it's been over a month since I've been at home in lockdown. On a Wednesday evening, I walk around my neighborhood for two hours and watch the moon rise. I don't bother plucking my eyebrows anymore. And to make things more depressing, I keep being drawn to books about war. But aren't most stories about living and dying in their own way? One day in April, I capture a series of moments of care. I receive an email from my friend, Gray Psycho Thompson. It says, believe in the good things, you are worthy of having them. My friends check in with me over text and call. How are you doing today? So how are you today? Hiromi drops off a surprise yuzu plant baby in a beautiful blue pot. I overhear the dad neighbor next door yelling, love you as a farewell greeting. Love you, see you, bye. I don't have the energy to clap or cheer at 7 p.m., but I can smile at people on my walk who do. I watch a couple seated underneath of a tree. Together, one rubs the other's back. What would I do for touch right now? I give myself to, to permission to sit cross-legged in the middle of one of those roundabouts with planted with flowers. The flowers smell good. The street is mostly quiet. The sky is about to turn orange and the sun dips lower and lower. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. It's so beautiful. Um, I really, really appreciate the diary form um, because it's a, it's a chronicling of the personal and the intimate, but also the historical now, um, which becomes historical, you know, later, but like catching the sort of the specifics of the emotional states um, and experience, um, it, it's, 
it's very vital. Um, and um, I, I, do, I don't journal. Um, I mostly like rage jot notes to crazy, man, angry, angry. Um, but like, then, then also forget um, sort of the, the, the specifics of the daily. Um, and so, yeah, to read that, especially about the pandemic too, um, brings back memories for me in a really evocative way. Mm -hmm. lovely. Yeah, I was just gonna say even like reading um, your diary comics in the in the lead up to us having this conversation, Erica, it just even though not that much time has passed, you can still see how it's true what you were saying, Hiromi, like it's a it's a historical record. Yeah, you made a comic about a comic that we can share here today that has I think a lot of the playgrounds taped off with the yellow tape. And now it's hard to think back about going back to that and all the fear that we had and yeah, the disconnect. Like it, was, like it was it was a lot of anxiety and fear. And then I actually forgot about the tied up playgrounds, but that that then it was in your comic and it was like, oh yeah, it was that bad. Like that anxiety was that that acute at that moment. Um and it's it was a blessing to be able to to remember that. And and that vision, the the image, like yeah. cues this response yeah. or this memory that yeah. that we wouldn't necessarily have in the same way with just text. Okay. So there's the, I think that the, uh, there's nuance of of the emotive that comes across with the the visual arts and the comics um, that works in a different frequency maybe than from text based only narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I've been following your Instagram posts uh, chronicling um, your journey and movement through grief um, these past two years. And you've been working on a very powerful series. Um, and um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you. Um, it's, it's actually, it's interesting. So, um, well, interesting is a weird word, isn't it? But um, it's just been so great to connect with both of you because we're doing all such different things and yet there's these links between them. So yeah, my partner died in April, 2020. So very soon after the pandemic was, you know, just becoming this huge reality. And in a way, my whole experience of the pandemic is deeply linked to her death. Um, and I, in reading Shadow Life, there are these ways in which um, your work really um, resonated with me. Like I'm thinking about the beautiful, that beautiful spread where um, Kamiko is remembering her her husband's death, and there's this the scene of the car in the water behind her, um, and just also like as a as a teacher of of comics, um, we, we've read that excerpt in class and it's just really powerfully um, affects my students, but that is a bit of a tangent, I acknowledge. But yeah, so I've been making these comics that are are really different from from Shadow Life and from Erica's Diary comics, but I also feel this, um, this kinship with you. So they're these abstract um, comics um, about grief and loss, and I'll just read um, one of them. Um, so you had mentioned, um, Hiromi, this idea about grief um, growing and changing, um, and, and that's what this comic is about. Um, so it's called Intexturement, which is a word that I made up. Um, you feel so much farther away this month ever since the year mark passed, really. Smudged, faded, muffled. I've been grateful for the quiet. But the loss of violent grief, bright, clear flashes of you, is a loss too. The thing that's happening now is new surfaces. I mean, new layers, new accumulations, accretions on parts of my life that started after you died. There's already patina, rust, moss, algae. You're really, really two summers gone. Plants chosen, tended, done, twice. People you never knew arrived, stayed, 
left. I wrote, erased, wrote, rewrote, forgot. Piles of things, new piles, rearranged piles. You're higher in the sky. Meanwhile, new hair, new glasses, new old face. Behind clouds and not in fact gone, only deeper, deeper. Um, there was, what I really love about this current project you're working on is I was surprised in, in some ways, I guess, that you're not illustrating the content of the text, if you know what I mean, like, mm -hmm. and you've chosen to, uh, really abstract images for the most part um, that aren't necessarily uh, directly connected to um, the text part um, in a visual uh, one equals one kind of way. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that choice or how that came to be. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's a little bit of a mix between conscious and, and instinctual. Um, uh, my partner's name was Donimo, and before she died, I had been doing some comics about her illness, and I really wanted, I was started seeking ways of, it's funny, it's kind of um, the opposite of what you, you were doing in a way with Shadow Life, is that I wanted to move away from the body. So there are um, comics that show her. Uh, it was really important to me to um, to show her as this queer, gender queer woman who um, is very masculine looking. But it was also um, when I came to talking about the loss of her, uh, there was a way in which um, imagery broke down. Mm. And I didn't really have anything besides color and shapes. Mm. Um, and and there's this weird way in which her death allowed my art to completely change and grow. Mm and that I feel this gratitude for that um, and find some joy in doing it. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's weird. <laughs> oh, that's Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Um, so often in all kinds of different stories um, and poems and essays too, um, a lot of the content is sort of conflict based, you know, there's um, a lot of struggles and strife um, because these are things that people experience uh, all the time in systemic and historical and um, current ways um, and part of lived realities. Um, but, you know, we've talked about um, joy a lot. Uh, Erika, particularly, you've been interested in the relationships between writing um, and joy. And um, maybe you can um, share some of your ideas on that. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I have been trying to get back into nonfiction writing lately and it's been hard to write about the joy, <laughs> even though that's like the theme, you know, I'm like keep like I have a folder, it's like seeking joy, you know, and all my <laughs> bookmarks are like related. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so then I keep writing about other stuff. Um, but I, I think even in the midst of, you know, terrible sadness or, or grief, like these experiences of of the pandemic, um, you know, the world is not all one way. It's not all black and white. Um, people are still falling in love. People are birthing babies, We've got Gen C. <laughs> um, people are learning to bake bread or playing Wordle. Like there's these little things that you do and or that just happen in your life that punctuates their lives with joy. And I think that's what I think that's something that the diary comics can can offer. It's mm -hmm. like this reflection of the everyday of of the mundane, whether that's um, moments of anxiety or sadness or or joy. And so I do think that's captured in some of those comics as well. Um, and yeah, they're not they're not so serious, you know. Like they're an entry point for people to to share about a moment for as a creator as a creative person um, but also for for readers um and i'm gonna be reading 
one more comic before Hromi shares some more as well. Um, so this is from May 2020, and uh, I'm drawing observations from a bike ride I took on a Sunday to meet a friend. A skateboarder stares longingly at the skate park through a chained off fence. More than a dozen cars line up at the Starbucks drive through. A few of them are stocked up with packs of toilet paper. I see a couple practicing riding their unicycles at a closed basketball court. The net has been removed uh, to discourage play from the, the hoop. I ride my bike down an empty street with no handlebars. It gives me a small thrill each time I lift both hands in the air, every time that I let go. We need joy. We need joy. <laughs> we need joy. <laughs> and there's lots of joy in satellite. I think um, I, you know, I cried reading this book. I laughed while reading this book. Um, it was so lovely to read this book after having the opportunity of getting to know you and hearing your voice come through. Um, and I really appreciated the ways that you you've chosen to depict joy in this in this book and it came out at such an opportune time thinking about um you know during the pandemic the limitations on joy for for our elders um and the rise in violence against um folks of the asian diaspora so to see this joyful elderly asian woman was so wonderful she's so powerful and strong and so i wanted to turn this question to you about what that importance was for you to be centering joy in this story um, in the story of, about death. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, being able to direct or uh, being able to frame a story on our own terms um, is so important because, you know, the difference between being spoken about and, and the difference between that and speaking for ourselves or speaking our stories for ourselves and whoever the, the, the hour is in terms of, you know, um, culture or genders or, you know, all, all abilities, what, whatever the hour is, being able to frame our own story um, is, is so powerful and meaningful and has impact, um, especially when there's systems of oppression, you know, still at work. Um, and then it's always, you know, trying a, a state of trying to dismantle and uh, dismantle, uh, center ourselves, um, but also trying to like have an amazing life. <laughs> like, it's just like, you know, I, I want to have fun um, and I want to laugh with my friends and, and I want to make a joyful noise. Um, like, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I I don't want to waste this life. I, I want it to be like a joyful noise, a loving noise. Um, and so to be able to do that on the page with Shadow Life um, was, you know, a, a gift to everyone, but also a gift to myself as well. Um, and um, for me, like the sort of very tied closely to to joy is is humor um, and sometimes I'll, I'll laugh out loud because I feel joy, um, which it's okay, but can also be misconstrued by people that I'm, I'm laughing at them, which so if, if I've ever laughed aloud and you thought, oh my gosh, she's laughing at me, it, it might not have been that. <laughs> like, okay. It's just like, yes, it's just like, sometimes I, I laugh because I feel so happy. Um, and so that humor, I wanted to bring that up um, in, in Kumiko's life so that she can be, you know, very, very joyful and very present to her, to her, to her joy. Um, and I, I think of that as like a, a powerful force of good. Mm -hmm. And it also disrupts and, and breaks up um, sort of patterns of, of um, oppression to, to be able to laugh. Um, it breaks it up in a different kind of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'll, I'll slide into the, the second part of the reading. Um, and 
This is from chapter three, um, just a very short excerpt. Morning, in apartment, Kumiko's head is tilted at an awkward angle. She moves stiffly, fingers are curled and stiff, neck is sore, lips downturned with pain. She is feeling her age today. Thinks, should have slept properly on my fdong and buckwheat pillow. Not a spring chicken. Mmm, chicken for dinner. The tilt of her head has her noticing floor corners, the floorboards, some soft mounds, dust strands of white hair that has accumulated. There are also some nail clippings. Kumiko, I need a vacuum cleaner. Thought I saw a repair store. Where was it? It had a creepy sign. Ponders, can't remember. A walk will work out the kink in my neck. She catches sight of her meds on the kitchen counter. Her purse is also there. Size, clumsily opens W compartment. Three pills inside, takes two out, places onto counter. She boils water, makes bowl of instant plain porridge, adds salt and a dollop of milk from the fridge, eats it dutifully at the counter without bothering to have a proper sit down breakfast at her table. Puts bowl into sink, then pours mug of cold water. She reaches for her two pills, but knocks them off the counter with her sleeve. They fly out and scatter on the floor. Shit. She slides one of the kitchen drawers open, holds a few odds and ends, tapes, ruler, eraser, couple pens, sticky notes, string. Also eyeglasses case. She takes out her glasses and puts them on. Head still tilted, she lowers body downward, her back held straight so that she can place both hands and place knees, place both knees onto the floor. She lowers hands uh, onto her hands and knees like a baby. Her hand presses into something. She pulls back. Pressed into her palm is one of the pills. She picks it out and rubs it against her shirt and pops the pill into her mouth before she loses it again. Dry swallows. She crawls around looking for the other pill. It's underneath the overhang of one cupboard, but she can't see it even though the reader can. Kumiko gives up, all grouchy. Stiffly stands up, brushes dust off of hands. Stares down at medication dispenser, thinks. Now, were you supposed to just skip it? Or are you supposed to take the next days? Stands there thinking for several seconds, removes her glasses and puts them away. Well, I don't have to worry about getting pregnant at any rate. Kumiko pictures herself being her age, but hugely pregnant, a sheepish look on her face, imagines her daughter's horrified faces. <laughs> Thank you. What a great, great line to end on, or an image to end on. And I wonder if you remember what it was like to get that that drawing back from Anne. Like, it must have been delightful. Um, I. I I can't, ima I can't imagine anyone doing a more perfect job of kind of capturing uh, Kumiko's spirit and her sort of mischievous nature. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, all of it is just kind of, it was, it's kind of magic, at, you know, the difference between having the script and then seeing the images. And then it's like uh, getting to see a story you had imagined in a fresh way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it was like a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, just before we move into the the question, the Q and A period, I I think we have time. For, I just, I wanted to just ask you. You both talked about joy, and I think one of the ways that we get joy is is by telling stories and 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 by just you know. It, participating in this act of creation. And can you can you say a little bit more about that? Like what it was like to just like bring this story to life and be able to look at the drawings and? Um, one of the motivating forces, speaking of, of wanting joy in, in a project was when I was working on Shadow Life, I actually wanted this to be fun. Mm -hmm. 
um, like I wanted it to be fun, like it, not superficial. Uh, that's fun doesn't have to be superficial, but that it that's it's, it's joyful, exuberant, um, fun to read, um, but also fun for me to write as well. And I feel like if that's the feeling I'm having while working on the project, then I can bring that that the spirit of that I think also enters the page. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I could easily say this was the most fun project that I've had to work on to, to date. And yeah. Kamiko was somebody who is fun to spend time with, I imagine. It was, it was a delightful, delightful. And you can bring her back. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. Also, Alice is so marvelous. Anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. spin off. Yeah, yes. spin off potential. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, and, and one book. <laughs> you do a lot more than one book. <laughs> yeah, three books. <laughs> oh, I like I it. Know. I like it. <laughs> what about you, Erica? Was that, is that part of your comics making, your diary comics, do you think? Joy? Yeah. Yeah, I think I appreciate. You know, sometimes when you're writing and it just the sitting and the reading and it's nice, maybe you can relate just to be able to bring out the, the colors. Like yeah. I've also used like all of these were made with watercolors yeah. and the first ones are pretty messy. Like I was literally just drawing with ink and then coloring it like I didn't do any pencil. Like I had to, my process has shifted a lot, um, but it was just really fun to, to, to blend colors, like even just doing really simple things with watercolors without having a lot of like technical skill. Yeah. Um, it's just really fun to experiment with. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there's just a vibrancy there too. Even just the joy of drawing like the food you ate that day. Like lately my diary has been like the foods I ate today. <laughs> like too tired to like be writing much, but I'll just like draw like my meals. And um, it's nice to remember the day in that way. Definitely, and even mm -hmm. just to watch that the watercolor going onto the page and kind of spreading on the page, mm -hmm. I think is is an important thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's part of us resisting what's all around us, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. I think that we are ready to um, do the super technical thing, um, which has been, you know, stressing me out all evening of like uh, getting the prop, the iPad. <laughs> And uh, looking at the, the questions from the Q&A. Um, and now it's asking me to log in, which, uh, but while we're waiting for that, I will, um, I, I wanted to ask you, Hiromi, I remembered a question that came in um, before the event. Um, and somebody was wondering about it, how Kamiko has this quality where it's hard for her to ask for help. Um, and the person who was asking the question was saying, do you think it's important for people to be able to ask for help? Like, is that a skill that we should be, that we should be teaching? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Asking for help. Oh boy, depending on, you know, what kind of uh, family system you've come from, you know, or in what, which cultures, um, asking for help can, can be framed by certain um, family systems as, as a sign of weakness, um, and which I, I don't believe asking for help is a sign of weakness. I think asking for help is, is actually very brave. Mm -hmm. um, because also, you know, is and in Western culture too, this idea of independence um, is very much um, um, held up as as sort of the the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm, I mean, I think it's so important that there's a strong sense of um, communal support, mm -hmm. um, be it directly familial or um, you know your uh, chosen family. Um, your friends, um, people from your community center, or perhaps people from your church, mm -hmm. but like broad, broad systems of, you know, shared support 
is is so important for you know just ha having a healthy life right yeah. and, and those connections are so important in shadow life yeah. there's um you know her her connections with her neighbors and yeah so you know if, if you if you move to a new city or you know you're um having to um flee one place for another and you have to start all over again it's you know it's it's hard to have those ties um yeah, immigration you know so creating those connections can take time mm -hmm. um and but definitely i think you know being supportive and being able to ask for help and accept help yeah. um, um and also accept help openly um and um without feeling guilty or ashamed yeah. which is you know those are you know really uh kind of those are burdensome you know emotions to be have to to carry mm -hmm. yeah and it's something that you um wrote a bit about in your diary comics right erica it's just like the one that you read where you kind of talk about harumi dropping off a, a plant and just the different ways in which your friends helped you and you helped them during the pandemic yeah definitely Okay, well, here is a very small uh, question. Um, how does one keep writing when they feel like they can't? What is, what is a way, um, I'll ask both of you this, um, that you, you know, obviously both of you have been writing through some, some pretty challenging times and I'm wondering how, what is, what is something that keeps you going? We said, um... We have writing dates actually. So then we have to write <laughs> because yeah. we're watching each other on FaceTime. <laughs> um, but I've been finding that's been helpful for me. Like I used to write before the pandemic in, in coffee shops with friends, but now at home, video calls are a great way. You can set a timer and, and also check in with, with friends on what they're working on. It's like an accountability process too. Accountability is good. Like sometimes, you know, we uh, another thing, an uh, easy trick is just to say how many words you've written that day. So I said, oh, I wrote two hundred and thirty-five words, um, and then you, that's all. You, that's all the message is, and it's just like, and then I think, oh, Erika wrote two hundred thirty-five words today. Um, it's like, oh, maybe I'll try a little harder. So it's a, it's a bit of right. motivation. Um, competition. Yeah, a little bit like healthy competition. Yeah. Um, and. and it's really helpful, but the, uh, there have been times when I can't write at all, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and you feel guilty, you know, all those things, all those emotions, you feel guilty or like, how can you call yourself a writer if you're not writing and all this negative talk um, and and that doesn't help inspire you to write either. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that happens, I just kind of try to step sideways mm -hmm. out of writing but to do something that is creative feeling. Cool. Um, Say more about that. <laughs> like your photography? Yeah, so photography is a kind of creative outlet. Um, it's, it moves away from word-based um, projects. Um, my mom said this interesting thing was, I was like, I, I just having a really hard time not only writing, but I also have a hard time reading, which I felt actually quite a bit of shame about not mm. being able to read. Um, and this could potentially be t connected to menopause as well, um, but not necessarily, yes. but maybe there could be overlap. Like everything. Yeah, like everything <laughs> yeah. there could be over, <laughs> just blame menopause. Um, but my mother said, um, oh, maybe you're tired of words. And then I got that gong kind of feeling. Um, and I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe I am tired of words. And so then this, and then I would, so then, but I still want to be able to make or shape or create something. Yeah. So like stepping sideways out of like words um, into something else, like watercolor, you know, and then you're making, creating. Basket weaving. Yeah, baskets, making baskets. Like it, it's just kind of doing, um, will I think nurture that, that creative organ inside mm. of you. That might be empty if you can't put words in it, but you put something else in it and it's happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I think there's also a lot to be said about, you know, living life and processing things that are happening and not just always forcing yourself to write. Like produce, produce. Because, produce, you know, like if you're writing 200 words versus like a thousand words, like what is the quality if you're just sitting and forcing yourself to keep free writing or keep, you know, going through prompts? Um, you know, maybe none of those words will get anywhere. And maybe, yeah, if there's other kind of creative outlets that, that people have to kind of get going and come back to it in an organic way. Maybe it shouldn't be forced, but that's hard to say when there's deadlines and, yeah. you know, work attached yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It sounds like both of you are talking about a more compassionate way of approaching yourself or a more joyful way of engaging with, with creative, creative pursuits. Yeah, moving away from the punishment model <laughs> to, yeah, yeah, you know, to, you know, like affirm, affirmative, affirmative goals, affirmative feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's not generally super effective to punish yourself for not writing. Yeah. Yeah. And so when your mom said that to you, like maybe you're tired of words, is that when you started getting really into photography or were you already? I, I was already. It, going deeply down that track so mm -hmm. yeah. it's it's yeah it, it, it definitely the photography is definitely you know not a word-based experience for me so although I do end up right ironically I end up writing something related to the photo that interests me that day mm -hmm. so it, I guess it comes around mm -hmm. in some kind of way yeah, I mean, Gwen mentioned your your photos at the beginning of the evening, and, you know, I love looking at them on Instagram, and everybody should, um, but it's, it's interesting to think about that this was your first graphic novel, and yet, and, and, and kind of, I guess, simultaneously, you're doing this word image combination where you're posting, um, you know, most of your photos are beautiful nature photos. You have a new camera, so there's these incredible close-ups. And then it seems like that sparks something in you to write about what you're what you're taking yeah, pictures of. Yeah. So now the, the the visual has become sort of the prompt. Um, and so instead of a text-based prompt, it's more like a, a visual prompt that it um, sets off a, a sort of a stream of thinking um, mm -hmm. that can be turned into writing. So yeah, so that instead of before where everything is uh, projects based off ideas of basic, mostly story, but word based stories in my head coming down on the paper as words. Now the process is uh, a photograph of, of the world around me, image, and then a written sort of response to it. Hmm. So it's, a, it's a, a different direction. Yeah. And so, so maybe I'll just ask you one last question, which is, um, can you tell us about what you're working on right now? Just kind of jumping off from what we were just saying about, about what your, what your photography practice is. Um, I'm working on a photo based project um, called a little beauty every day, which is the practice that I've had like now for uh, over six years. Um, and it used to be quite rigorously daily. So it was kind of like a daily gesture of appreciation and gratitude to the world, living non-human living world around uh, me, wherever I'm at that time. Um, and so turned that into a, a, a book project. Um, so now it's it's been it's been a process piece, but now I'm turning it into a book project, which changed the experience yet again. Hmm. So there's like a learning curve there as well. Yeah, beautiful. So so that's what we can expect to to see from you next is this kind of going from graphic novel to photo and text based project. I hope so. Thank you so much. You. Um, it's been so amazing to hear from you today, Haromi, and to talk with you, Erica, as well. Thank you for yeah. this conversation. Love it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Sadly, that's all the time that we have for this evening. 
thank you, Hiromi, Sarah, and Erica for that warm and deeply thoughtful conversation. Uh, it was so wonderful to hear you draw out so many of the themes from Shadow Life, uh, the body, aging, grief, queerness, to hear more about the creative process that went into it and Hiromi, how you and Anne worked together. I was deeply curious about that when I was reading the book. Thank you also for talking about joy and bringing us all some joy and humor tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to hear how you have continued to nurture that creative organ inside you, as you said. So thank you all very much for that. I also want to thank our event partners SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and SFU Public Square. My thanks also to the people from the SFU Library who worked to make this event possible, including especially Heather DeForest and the amazing, wonderful, and multi-talented Chloe Riley. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful night.